With episode 91 of Dragon Ball Super in the books, we are getting closer and closer to that 100 episode special. But before we get there, we gotta talk about episode 91 of Dragon Ball Super. So without wasting any more time, let's get straight into this video as I will give you my good and bad breakdown of episode 91. So let's get started. So, starting off with the good, from a comical perspective, I love the scene where we see Vegeta going to train into the hyperbolic time chamber and Mr. Popa warns him saying, if you break it again, you're gonna be banned from using it. And the way Vegeta just looked back at him, I got the feeling that Vegeta said to himself, you really think I'm gonna listen to some fat black ass nigga telling me what the fuck to do? One other thing I loved about this episode is that we've learned so far that Universe 9 is the butt of all jokes team in this tournament of power. Literally, they have nobody else who's going to be fighting in this tournament of power. And I thought that was hilarious how they're going around to other planets in desperation trying to find whatever they can. As we see those bandits attacking, unfortunately, and Sidra had to just wipe out the whole planet. And they're just going around the universe scouting. And to me, that was hilarious. It's kind of fucked up for all those people who unfortunately are going to die as a result of that. But that was interesting none the least now one scene i really loved in this episode would have to be the interaction between hit and frost as we see in this episode hit actually goes out to recruit frost but frost was actually terrified at first because he feels like hit is coming to literally kill him and execute him you know because he's pretty much a fugitive in this dragon ball super world but hit needs him for the torment of power and i really like the fact that you know frost sneaking around really enforces how sneaky his character is unlike frieza who's more brash and just runs into walls that he can't always tear down frost is smart he's not just gonna go after a person who could easily defeat him just because of his ego and that's one thing i really liked and i also loved seeing how as they were talking and hit was saying how he needed him for the tournament after their conversation hit says okay and please don't use any needles and i also noticed that you have some needles in your heels as well after hit had pretty much already disabled you know frost from attacking him and pretty much put a stop to him and the thing I love the most about this scene, guys, is it creates a sense of tension more than anything else. Because with Frost being in this tournament of power and being this sneaky-like character, can you really trust that he's going to do everything for the betterment of his universe? Absolutely not. And that's what makes this whole Universe 6 team so interesting. They're literally recruiting villains to fight for them. And that's one thing that I found really interesting about that scene. That was definitely one of the best scenes in this episode. Now... This episode, like I said, has some humor in it, and we go back to Yamcha, who's another butt of all jokes character, and he's lying in bed, watching some TV with Poir, and Master Roshi comes because he needs to test his focus on being able to fight against women as he gets so distracted by you know attractive women and you know his perverted nature makes it very hard for him to concentrate in fights if he's fighting an attractive woman but the interesting about this guys is that he doesn't ask oolong to do it he comes all the way to ask puar because he's already had a history of doing this with oolong and oolong's frustrated and this is a reference going all the way back to dragon ball where master roshi came over to stop the fire on mount frypan and oolong disguised himself as bulma to pretty much seduce master roshi in exchange for master roshi taking out the fire and i thought that that was a very funny scene and it was interesting seeing how they're kind of making some old references in dragon ball super so that was a good thing and how could i forget about yamcha a character who's like one of the biggest memes in the Dragon Ball series, literally being shafted once again. And he was asking Wulong, hey, do you think they're going to ask me to join the Tournament of Power? And Wulong's like, oh yeah, sure, totally, dude. And it's just so funny to me how like they've literally been shafting Yamcha so much that even the super staff is aware of all of these Yamcha memes. I just love it, guys. Now... One cool thing here is we see Goku training with Whis, and as they're fighting, you know, Goku bites Whis, and Goku's done this many times in the Dragon Ball series, and he's done it against Frieza, he's done it against Kid Buu. Now, touching on people in other universes, we see Casserole once again, who is the pilot of the Pride Troopers, and... 
we see a little bit of Toriyama-esque gag humor as Casserole is trying to save this alien cat who ran up, you know, this platform and he could easily fly to this cat or jump over and grab him, but he doesn't want to startle him so he doesn't, you know, get electrocuted and die. And it's kind of funny, like, you see, like, these super big, tough, macho characters, like, trying to save cats. And in addition to this, I also noticed that the two inhabitants behind Casserole bear a very, very, very strong resemblance to the Amekians from Dragon Ball GT. So that's also another thing I noticed there. Furthermore, one universe that we really haven't known a lot about is Universe 2. But this week actually taught us some stuff. In last week's preview, we saw a girl with green hair in the preview, and I was wondering what that character actually was. I said that she would definitely have to have a role with this episode if they would put her in the preview, and it turns out that this character's name is Brian de Chateau. And after brushing up on some of my French after I looked at my old high school dictionary, her name can translate literally to Brian of the Palace, because Chateau in French literally translates to palace. It could also mean Chateau Brian, which is a city in France. And last but not least, it could also be Chateau Brian, which is a type of steak that people eat. One thing that I immediately noticed as this Brian character was in the episode is that she had a transformation into a fat, Majin Buu looking Teletubby character. Anybody who watches anime could have known that that was an immediate parody of Sailor Moon. And the reason I noticed this is because when I was a kid and my sister, you know, would watch Dragon Ball with me every now and then when she would bring over her VHS tapes, she would force me to watch Sailor Moon and I would always remember those long extended power-ups into transformations so that was definitely a wacky bizarre scene this Brienne character she literally just killed people with this pretty cannon like she literally just killed two people in broad daylight in a city like that's like cruelty but she did it with such an elegant nice fashion it was wacky but I loved it I really liked that scene it was weird as hell but I really honestly loved that scene guys and last but not least Going back to Universe 10, we see Cuss and all of the Universe 10 fighters dancing as they're trying to put a video on GodTube as Gowasu's recording and he's saying hopefully this is going to get a lot of views and I thought that that was hilarious how Gowasu is like, you know, obviously using like the internet in these universes and it really added a very humanistic feel to all of the other universes. It gave them personality outside of fighting and it really made them feel like they're just normal people just like people in Universe 7 with just more aliens and different planets and different life and I kind of like that. It added more flavor to the drive. Dragon Ball Super Universes. But we can't have a review talking all about the good stuff, can we? And to talk about some of the bad, I have to say this, guys. Why the hell haven't they used the hyperbolic time chamber beforehand? I mean, don't you think Goku, Gohan, Piccolo, Vegeta, Krillin, Android 18, any of these characters could have really have benefited from using the hyperbolic time chamber? In addition to this, Elder Kai says, hey, do you want me to unlock your power? But the Supreme Kai says, well, you have to wait 25 hours for this. And I'm thinking to myself, do you know how much bad shit has gone on in Dragon Ball Super with villains or people that Goku needed to fight? And you're all of a sudden deciding that you want to bring out Goku's power now. Unlock Goku's potential now now so all these years have gone by and you never fucking thought about doing this shit beforehand and in addition guys i cannot exclude this from the video do you really expect me to believe that zeno of all people has absolutely no clue about how the universes work and he's just finding this out now so us who watch dragon ball super as we see the episodes unfold knew about this a long ass time ago and zeno who's like the god of the god of the gods knew none of this for all of these centuries and millennia or however long he's existed even if he's childlike he's had no clue and last but not least guys the number one problem i had in addition to zeno would have to be the fact that Mr. Satan calls Bulma 
late at night. And there was a nice little scene before this where Bulma had a nice motherly smile as she's putting Bra to bed. But Mr. Satan calls her to tell her that Boo is asleep. And I'm gonna make a video later on this week talking more about this, but... To me, guys, it's like, this shit is happening all over again. This fucker sleeps whenever they just want him to sleep to make the plot more intriguing without Majin Buu because he could just turn everybody to candy and just throw them out of the world of Void and just make it too easy. Or maybe he's too much of a gag character and we need to make it more serious. Whatever reason they have, they keep shafting Majin Buu, guys, and I'm sorry, but I just hate it. It's like, you've made this joke go on too long now. But overall, guys, to talk about some discussion points where I want you guys to give me some of your thoughts on these unanswered questions. Seeing Yamcha lying in his bed with Poir. And seeing how Poir can transform into an attractive woman. And assuming that Yamcha is single or doesn't have any women on the side. My friend Jax Blade and I have often wondered... Any time of the day or night that Yamcha might ask Poir to turn himself into a sexy woman similar to what Naruto does with the sexy jutsu in Naruto just so he can have some nice fun and action at night guys. I wonder about that guys. Let me know what you think in the comment section below and considering that Poir easily became a female he clearly can do it whenever he wants. So it's a question for you. Now, in terms of the preview, there are some interesting things we see here. Who is one of the Supreme Kais from Universe 3. We see him in the preview, and it also appears that from a distance that Moscow is in the background where we see all of these robotic-like characters. So, this probably seems like they're going to be going out and doing some type of recruitment for the Tournament of Power. In addition to this, we see Roshi and Poir once again in the upcoming preview for Episode 92. So, this shows me that... Obviously, Roshi is trying to really take this seriously. Like, this isn't just complete gag humor. Like, he actually wants to be focused on this. And I can understand if Roshi sees Khalifla or Kale in the battle and he gets distracted. Now, the big ultimate thing that the preview gave away is we see a Super Saiyan Khalifla in the next episode. And it looks like she's powering up and blasting. And that was interesting because... If we see Super Saiyan Khalifla, well, that clearly means that Kaba was wrong about all of these other characters, you know, being so shocked about being a Super Saiyan in their universe. And in terms of Khalifla's expression, at the very end of the preview, we see that Khalifla kind of looks googly-eyed as if she's having some type of attraction towards Kaba. And there's already been some Rule 34 things about Khalifla and Kaba, surprisingly. So, Krillin and 18 are going to be dropping out of the tournament. I don't think they're going to be dropping out of this because I feel like dropping three out of ten characters was too bad for the plot. Even if you replace Frieza with, you know, Majin Buu, you know, or Majin Buu with Frieza, it still to me doesn't make sense to cut that many characters out. And I think with the whole stakes on the line, Krillin and 18 are going to pretty much just toughen up and just go into battle as they need as much manpower as possible for this tournament. So with everything else said, guys, I'm going to have to give this episode four stars. The episode felt somewhat refreshing with all of the rotating characters, especially with all of the other universes, and it made the other universal characters more relatable in terms of their persona and what they like to do versus our universe. But at the same time, this episode had a few moments that really made you scratch your head when it pertains to the logic and consistency of the series. The only thing is, the moments that were bad weren't like so bad that it really killed the episode. This episode felt fillerish, but it was good. It wasn't great, it was above average, and it wasn't bad or terrible. But it was a good episode and I kind of like these slice of life episodes where we learn more about characters and just seeing how they interact. It gives another appeal to the Dragon Ball world. So with everything else said guys, please remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. And remember as I always say to have a great day guys.